One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! יברכך אדוני וישמרך, יאר אדוני פניו אליך ויחונקה, יישא אדוני פניו אליך וישם לך שלום. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday, and welcome to the NTEB House Church Sunday morning service. King Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 12, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now, that's pretty good. But it's an Old Testament perspective where they had a corporate relationship with God as a nation and not as individuals. Remember, Nobody in the Old Testament who died in faith was saved like you and I are saved. They went to Abraham's bosom. They didn't go to heaven right away. For those of us who are born again and part of the body of Christ, our relationship with God is an intimate and personal relationship with someone who loved us so much that he took our place on Calvary's cruel cross and died the death that we deserve in our place. This is not the God of a far distant heaven speaking through prophets. This is the God of heaven come down to earth, manifest in the flesh, somebody we can see and hear and touch. Hebrews tells us that, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are yet without sin. Today I would like to bring you a message that may just radically change how you view serving God, not because you have to or because he forces us to, but because he is worthy to receive it. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, this is our text for today. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we ask for your blessing on today's uh, worship service. We thank you, God, for the many people that you've gathered already in the chat room. And we pray, Lord, for everybody listening live and who will hear this program in the archives, that something would be said and done today, Lord, to lead a lost soul to you. Uh, God, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and your mercy. And uh, we thank you for waking us up today, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the food on the table and the clothes on our back and the roof over our head. And, uh, Lord, we commit this time to you, Father, and we ask for your blessing. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Very glad that you're here. Happy Sunday. Uh, Sunday is my uh, favorite day of the week. I love uh, meeting with God's people, with the family of God, with the body of Christ, Uh, And I love to meet around an open King James Bible. And I hope that when you attend these online services, that you have your King James Bible with you, next to you, open in front of you, and that you're following along with the verses. And um, what a blessing it is to be able to hold God's preserved word in our hand and uh, to read it and to believe it and let it radically, radically change our lives. Uh, Yesterday I listened to, and I had heard this before, but yesterday I listened to um, a testimony from Dr. Ruckman that I guess it 
probably was recorded sometime in the 1980s, probably around 1986 or 1987. You can find it on YouTube. Just search for Peter Ruckman's testimony to Jesus Christ. And uh, for those of you in the chat room, I'm going to put the link into the chat room right now. Uh, Don't listen to it now. (laughs) But I highly recommend that later on this afternoon, you make yourself a cup of coffee or green tea or whatever it is you like to uh, drink. And uh, I recommend that you listen to Peter Ruckman's testimony of how he got saved. And uh, there was something in there that I'm going to be talking about this morning that greatly convicted me about uh, witnessing and handing out tracts and telling lost people about Jesus Christ. And uh, Dr. Ruckman has a very, very powerful testimony. And um, it's, it's similar in some ways to my own testimony. And I can remember... I can remember um, for the 28 and a half years, the, no, I'm sorry, 29, almost 30 years uh, that I was an unsaved Roman Catholic and uh, the amount of times that somebody handed me a gospel track, I think was only one or two times that I ever recall getting a piece of gospel literature before I was saved. And uh e- Even after we started the street preaching that we do here in St. Augustine that we've been doing um, on the corner of Hippolyta and St. George Streets since about 2012, um, only one time, only one time has anybody ever come up to me and asked me if I was saved. Only one time has anybody ever handed me a gospel track and... um, When Dr. Ruckman was talking about that in his testimony that I watched last night on how he walked up and down the streets of Pensacola, Florida, as an unsaved man, and uh, after he got saved, he realized that nobody ever gave him the gospel, and he lived in a town that was filled with Christian churches back then, just the way it is today. And uh, our problem is not that we don't have enough churches. Our problem is not that we don't have enough pastors or preachers. Our problem is, is that saved people don't tell unsaved people about Jesus Christ. That's the main problem that we have. We don't need more churches. We don't need more buildings where people will come in and listen to some preaching, do some singing, go home, and then not think about Jesus Christ until Wednesday night. What we need, what we need is more on-fire, born-again Christians, like what we have here at Now the End Begins, to go get themselves some gospel tracts and to go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that God's house may be full. That's what we need today. We don't need an international revival. We need an internal revival among saved Christians to want to go out and tell lost people how to get saved. That's what we need today. We need to get back on fire for Jesus Christ. Remember when you first got saved, you told everybody about Jesus Christ. You didn't care if you got laughed at. You didn't care if you got shunned. You didn't care if your family and friends made fun of you. The only thing that you cared about was telling somebody else about Jesus Christ so that they could get saved the way that you got saved. And then over time, over time, that fire began to dim to a low flame. And over time, that fire has almost gone out. Today, I want to rekindle that fire. Today, I want to get you back in service for the Lord Jesus Christ. You might be backslidden today. I don't know your spiritual condition. You may be on fire. And I I praise God for that. But it's highly likely that at the very least, you've kind of settled into that horrible, lukewarm middle area. And hey, in my 30 years of walking with the Lord, I have been lukewarm at times. 
My fire has gone almost out at times. And today, I want to remind you how you felt the day you got saved. I'm glad I'm saved today, man. Yes. Praise God. Bible says in Psalm 7, verse 17, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Psalm 66, 2 says, Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Psalm 100, verse 4, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Psalm 102, verse 21, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. Psalm 145, verse 21, my mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. And all through the Bible, we see uh, that God is worthy to receive praise. And this morning, I want to bring you a message about the importance of understanding the reason why we serve God. 
not because we're forced to, not because we have to. Your serving God has nothing to do with your salvation. That's your sanctification. And you will be judged on your sanctification at the judgment seat of Christ. Absolutely no doubt about it. But you're not going to be judged on your salvation because that had nothing to do with you. Salvation was a free gift that you accepted because you didn't want to go to hell. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't earn it. You can't work to get it. You can't work to keep it. That's what the Bible says. It is of him. It is not of you. So why? Why do we serve Jesus Christ? Because he's worthy. Because he went to the cross in your place and he took your punishment that you deserve. The Bible says this um, in Titus chapter 3. Starting in verse 3, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish and disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, But according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's what Jesus Christ did for you. And if you ever get cold in your Christian life, if you ever uh, find yourself up against a brick wall or a dead end and you pray and it seems like nothing is happening, you read the Bible and it just seems dry and dull. If you ever want to get yourself back on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ, all you have to do is remind yourself that there was a day when you personally and individually We're on your way to a place called hell. Now, the Bible says about hell that it's a place of outer darkness, yet it is filled with flames. The Bible says there there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. The Bible says it is a place where the smoke of your torment will ascend up forever and ever, and you will have no rest day nor night. And Jesus Christ came down. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh, made visible, made open, made plain, made clear. The Bible says that there was a day where God came down in the form of Jesus Christ and he took your punishment on his body on the tree. Now, think about that. Maybe you prayed for a mate and God hasn't answered that prayer. Maybe you've prayed for financial issues and God hasn't answered that prayer yet. Maybe you have prayed for health issues and you're still waiting for God to answer that prayer. Maybe you have a spouse that is not saved or a child that is not saved and you're still waiting. You've been praying for that child for 17 years. And God still hasn't answered that prayer yet. When you hit those times, I want you to think about what God did for you personally the day you got saved. And your punishment in hell that you deserve was forever canceled and you became saved by the blood of the crucified one. That's what we're going to be talking about today. We serve him not because we're forced to, because we're not forced to, not because we have to, because we don't have to. You could get saved and then you could sit in your lounge chair and drink beer and watch baseball games for the rest of your life and you would still die a saved person, but you would be miserable when you got to the judgment seat of Christ and saw that you had no rewards because you did nothing to serve him after you got saved. Why do we serve God? 
because he is worthy for us to do that.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation. Thank you, God, for your mercy and your grace. Heavenly Father, we come before you one more time and ask for your blessing on this morning's service. Jeffrey in Kentucky says, Prayer request for the Cincinnati Reds game. Huge crowds for the past few days. They're hearing the gospel, but they won't take the gospel tracks. He says, They look at me like a deer in the headlights. Got eggs thrown on me from a balcony Friday, but they missed. And he says, What a blessing to be persecuted in such a small way. Uh, he says, Game time is uh, one ten, um, Cincinnati time. So please pray for uh, Jeffrey in Kentucky, uh, that God would give him uh, an open door to preach to the people who were choosing to spend their Sunday afternoon at the baseball game. Uh, pray for people to get saved. Pray for some people to start taking the tracks. Shea Caster says, uh, prayers for the victims in the Miami building collapse, uh, for the victims and the families, and hopefully many more miraculous rescues. Amen. Little Toe says, uh, prayers for his neighbor, June, who just went to the hospital. She is over 80, and she was recently diagnosed with COVID. So Little Toe wants us to pray for uh, his neighbor, June, with COVID. Rob says, witness to my 90-year-old aunt the other day, and she was floored by my testimony. Uh, please pray for her salvation. My grandmother got saved when she was five days from her 100th birthday. So absolutely uh, pray for Rob's aunt, his 90-year-old aunt, to get saved. Nat says, good morning, everybody. I can't stay long, but please pray for my knee replacement surgery on Friday. Thank you, church family. Rob says, uh, please pray for my cousin Elaine. She has cancer and she's near the end. Donna Lynn says, when I got saved, my daughter stopped talking to me. That is over a year ago. Amen. I, re I remember when you got saved, Donna. Amen. Amen. You got saved through this program. And uh, that's what a blessing that is. Friday, God answered my prayers and gave me the courage to stop her at the house and confront her. And now we are on speaking terms. Please pray that God will open her heart a little bit more. Amen. Uh, Jay Gass says, uh, pray for my father-in-law, Tony, who is struggling with alcoholism, severe back pain and sudden drop foot. Uh, when God saved me, I was an alcoholic. And uh, God absolutely can save an alcoholic. And we're going to pray for uh, Jay Gass's father-in-law, Tony. Terry says, uh, please remember me as I'm starting a new life on my own. I need God's mercy and grace as I carry out his will for my life. Amen. Uh, m, m says, good morning, NTEB family. My best friend, Elaine, is visiting today in person. We live in New York and she lives in Maryland. Ellen's uh, niece, Sarah, has been diagnosed with stage four cancer, about to undergo chemo. Please pray for a miracle. She is a young wife and mother of 41 years old. Amen. Uh, and Hannah 13 says, prayers for my friend's sister who lost her husband. And I also want to pray this morning uh, for uh, Lorianne and Jeanette, uh, who are here and such a valuable part of of this ministry, NTEB. I want to pray that God continues to keep his hands and blessing on Lorianne and Jeanette. And I want to pray for Harmon's son, Michael, who is still battling pancreatic cancer. I want to pray for Chelsea out on the West Coast. Uh, uh, she really needs to get back on track with the Lord, and we're going to lift her up this morning. And I want to pray uh, a praise report uh, for Jacqueline in New Mexico who is, she has been praying for many, many months now that she would hear from the Lord. And she's, yesterday she told me that she is hearing from the Lord and, 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 and she had tears in her eyes. She was so happy and so thrilled that God would answer that prayer. Jesus says in John chapter 10, my sheep know me and they hear my voice and they follow me. If you're a child of God, it's a Bible promise that uh, you will hear from Jesus Christ. Just read John chapter 10 sometime. Heavenly Father, for all these prayers and for the unspoken prayers of our hearts, we come before you this morning and uh, we thank you, God. 
and we thank you for your mercy and your goodness. And we ask you, Lord, to meet with us this morning and to hear the prayers and the cries of our heart that we have already lifted up. Lord, you know all the needs. You know all the reasons. We don't need to go into great detail. But as a church family, God, we come before you. And we ask for your blessing, Father God. We ask you to meet with us this morning. We ask you to hear these prayers and answer these prayers. Help us today, Father God. And uh, for every need, Lord, please provide an answer and make it clear and make it plain and let it be a blessing. Our faith is so encouraged when we pray and we see you answer, Lord. And we ask you to work and move in a mighty way in all these situations as only you can. And we commit this time to you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again, everybody. If you're just tuning in, uh, you have reached the NTEB House Church Sunday morning service, and we're glad that you're here today. Uh, Turn to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, and I want to read a few passages from Revelation chapter 4, where we are going to get our text this morning in verse 11 of Revelation chapter 4. And uh, Revelation chapter 4 is that great, great, great chapter uh, where after 2,000 years of the church age, the church is removed in something called the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And in type, that's what we see happening here in verses 1 and 2. Revelation 4 verses 1 and 2. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardin stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So it's a green rainbow. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. This is what the Apostle John sees when he gets taken up into heaven, and uh, he is shown, the curtain is pulled back, and the Apostle John is shown what heaven is uh, all about and what it looks like. And uh, John is in a vision, and he is seeing these things with his eyes, and he is hearing these things with his ears. If you remember from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, in starting in verse 20, John 21, starting in verse 20, we see the prophecy that Jesus Christ gave that the Apostle John would not die until he saw all the events related to the second coming. John 21, starting in verse 20. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter saith unto Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Talking about John the Apostle. Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, He shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? And then John says in verse 24, This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So Jesus Christ prophesied over Peter in John 21, and he told him that he was going to die on the cross just like Jesus, and that's how he was going to bring glory to God. And when Peter receives that prophecy that we see in verses 18 and 19, of John 21, Peter is not happy. And so he immediately turns around and says, well, what about John? (laughs) Well, maybe you or I might have done the same thing if Jesus just prophesied over us that we were going to die on a cross. But 
when Peter asks the Lord about the Apostle John, Jesus said that he is going to give John a unique thing. He is going to allow John to live long enough to see the second coming. Now, we know that, when, now back to Revelation chapter 4, we know that um, the book of Revelation uh, shows you the entire seven year time of Jacob's trouble. It shows you the church age, it shows you the pre tribulation rapture of the church. It shows you the battle of Armageddon, the second coming, uh, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, the great white throne judgment, new heavens and a new earth, and then it shows you eternity. And the apostle John had that prophecy from John 21 fulfilled the day that he was in exile on the island of Patmos, and... um, Uh, He was pulled up to the throne room of God, and he saw these incredible things. Uh, Now, uh, Revelation 4, 1 and 2 shows you the pre-tribulation rapture in type, because John was a type of the church. The Bible says that John was the disciple that Jesus loved, and he also loved the church and gave himself for it. Uh, The Apostle John was the only apostle still standing at the foot of the cross when Jesus said his last words and he died, and he took in Mary among the brethren. So the Apostle John is a type of the church, and in Revelation chapter 4, a type of the church is taken up in a type of the rapture. But this is what John saw when he got there, starting in verse 5 of Revelation 4. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. These are the four beasts that we read about in the book of Daniel. Uh, Verse 8 says, And the four beasts, each had of them six wings about him. Uh, This is like the book of Isaiah now. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And here in this one verse, we see that up in heaven, all these amazing beasts and all the hosts of heaven and all the angels and the raptured church and the body of Christ and everybody when they get up into heaven and they're looking at the Lord face to face, What are we going to be saying at that time? We're going to be saying, Lord, that you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power. Why? Well, because you created everything and everything was created for your pleasure. And you redeemed everything. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God believes that so strongly that he came down himself to provide the ransom. Now that's, I mean, talk about putting some shoe leather to your faith. God believed in what he said so strongly that he said, I'll lead by example. How much do I want you guys not to go to hell? I will pay your debt for you. I will take your punishment on my body, on the cross. Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, um, starting in verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, 
and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us, here it is, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us, that's the rapture, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Why is God worthy to receive praise and honor and glory? Because of what he did for you and what he did for me on the cross. Because of his willingness to provide a way out of what you and I both so richly deserve. That's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. The Bible calls what Jesus Christ did, he calls it God's unspeakable gift. Because it is the highest thing that you could do for anybody else. Uh, The Bible says, No greater love hath any man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Now, in the same passage, it goes on to say from a human perspective that there may be some people who would lay down their life for their friends. There may be some people who would give the ultimate sacrifice for good people. But that's not all that Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ laid down his life for people that hated him. Jesus Christ laid down his life for people that mocked him and scourged him and humiliated him and whipped him and beat him. Jesus laid down his life for people who openly rejected him and still openly reject him today. They cried, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. We don't care if you kill Jesus. His blood can be on our heads and our children's heads and our children's children's heads. Now, that is the love of God, that he gave his life For the ungodly, the Bible says in due time, he gave his life for the ungodly, for the sinner, for the reprobate. A couple of years ago, I wrote an article called, As Serial Killer Charles Manson Lay Dying, Could You Take a Moment to Pray for His Salvation? And man, oh man, I got a lot of pushback on that article. I got a lot of people who said that that was a disgusting thing for me to say. The very idea that uh, uh, Charles Manson might be in heaven. And a lot of people got angry at that article that I wrote. But when I look at it, when I look at the Bible, when I open my King James Bible in my hand and I read it and I see what God did, God died for people who were Worse than Charles Manson. God died for uh, Adolf Hitler and and uh, and Mag, uh, Mao Zedong and and uh, Stalin and Lenin and and every type of reprobate and serial killer and pedophile and rapist and murderer and uh, thief and liar. Jesus Christ shed His blood for all of those people. Can you imagine seeing Adolf Hitler in heaven? Now, it's highly likely that you won't because Adolf Hitler died. Adolf Hitler was a type of antichrist, and Adolf Hitler died cursing God. But had Adolf Hitler, even after killing 12 million people in concentration camps, and even after causing a war that killed 55 million people around the world, is the... Shed blood of Jesus powerful enough to put Adolf Hitler into heaven? The answer is absolutely 100% yes. There is no question about it. Now, Adolf Hitler was, he died a Roman Catholic. He had no testimony of salvation. 
Never at any point in his life did he ever say anything or do anything or write anything or draw a picture. He was an artist or paint a picture of anything that that could lead anybody to believe that on any level Adolf Hitler got saved. But had he asked God to save him like the thief on the cross, Lord, when thou comest into thy kingdom, remember me. Had Adolf Hitler done that, he would be in heaven right now. And that's the part that a lot of the times when we've been saved for a little bit of time and we kind of forget the pit that God found us in. And even after God pulled us out of the miry pit and he washed us off and cleaned us up, how often have we tried to return to that pit since we got saved? And how many times do we struggle in our Christian life battling the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's a tough battle. I don't care what anybody says. And if you meet somebody that says that they don't struggle with the world, the flesh, and the devil, and they want you to believe that they're saved, I would have a hard time believing that testimony. The Apostle Paul says this uh, in 2 Timothy 4, "For, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Uh, Why is Paul getting a crown? Because he fought a fight. Because he finished his course. Because he kept the faith. Now, did the apostle Paul win every single fight that he fought? The answer is no. And that's recorded in uh, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, he says uh, in verse 18, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, meaning I have a desire to do it. But how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. And so the Apostle Paul talks about the Christian struggle and the Christian life and the Christian battle. And sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. And it's just as simple as that. But when the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course and I have kept the faith. Are you in the fight? Are you fighting the good fight? Or are you largely keeping to yourself and keeping out of the way and uh, not going to the front lines very often where the bullets are flying, not getting into the thick of the fray? Um, on Facebook yesterday, I saw a bunch of people were um, uh, commenting on a post, is it a sin for a Christian to drink alcohol? Well, I suppose... <laughs> that you could make a case that it's not a sin to, con- to consume alcohol if you don't get drunk, which um, that's where about 99% of every single alcoholic that ever became an alcoholic, um, that's always been what they've tried to do. They've tried to drink without getting drunk. But it's very, very hard to do that because of Proverbs 20, verse 1. Now, I told you last week that when I posted this verse, Facebook banned me uh, from, and I had to, you know, click all these boxes and click all these buttons and do I agree or disagree with their ruling. But Proverbs 20 verse 1 says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Now, That's what alcohol is. Alcohol is a mocker. Strong drink will rage on you. So even if for a time you can drink alcohol and not get drunk, if you keep doing that long enough, the statistics go very much against you the longer that you do it. 
And why? Because wine that is made, earthly wine, I'm not talking about new wine. I'm not talking about the wine that Jesus made at the wedding feast of Canaan, which was not alcoholic wine, in my opinion. And the reason why I have always said, now, don't get me wrong. When God saved me, I was an alcoholic. I got saved in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, we had a few prayers this morning for loved ones that are struggling with alcohol. I have struggled with alcohol. I have the victory today. Uh, I haven't had a drink in a number of years, and I praise the Lord for that. But I know that if I were to start to um, play fast and loose with Proverbs 20, verse 1, I know that at some point I would wind up being an alcoholic again. So, I take that verse very seriously. The Bible says that wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Alcohol will deceive you. Alcohol will lead you down a path to which you do not want to go. Now, what does all this have to do with Revelation 4 verse 11? Let's read it. Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. God found me in the miry pit, headed for hell, working in Hollywood, living the dream, as they say, and absolutely suicidal and miserable. And God reached down and he said, Would you like my free gift of salvation? And when I was finally faced with what that gift was, and for me it was John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's where I got in, on John 3.16. And when God saved me that day, I have forever been filled. I've been saved 30 years now, but I have been forever filled with a sense of gratitude. Obligation? Absolutely. But it's more gratitude than obligation. And why do I do the things that I do? Because hell is real and people die and people go there. And Paul tells me in that same passage in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he tells Timothy, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, for the time will come where they will not um, endure sound doctrine, but shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and shall be turned away from the truth unto fables. What an honor that it is, and what a privilege that it is to preach and teach the life-saving words of God. This is why we get so excited about street preaching, why we get so excited about Bible prophecy, why we get so excited about the King James Bible, why we don't use any other version but the King James Bible. Because we believe that that's where God preserved his word. That word that saved my soul 30 years ago. Revelation chapter 4 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. What is God calling you to do today? I don't know what God's calling you to do. I'm asking you, what is God calling you to do today? If you're saved, if you're a child of God, God is absolutely calling you to do something. Now, I am not one of those preachers where I'm going to put pressure on you to become a foreign missionary, and God may not be calling you to become a foreign missionary. God may not be calling you to become a pastor or a preacher or a Bible teacher. I don't know what God is calling you to do, but I do know this. I do know 
uh, that God is calling you to do something. (laughs) Absolutely. There is no question about it. If you're saved, if you're a child of God, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye de- if you do those things, ye shall never fail. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter says, make your calling and election sure. Now, I meet people from time to time, and it's a, it's a fair amount of people, and they tell me that they don't feel called to do anything. Now, um, one reason for that is you may be saved, but how is your prayer life? Do you have a strong prayer life? The Bible says that we need to uh, pray without ceasing. How do we do that? How do you pray without ceasing? Well, you have a constant running conversation with God. First uh, Thessalonians chapter five. First Thessalonians chapter five, starting in verse fourteen. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak. Be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. These things in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul says, is absolutely God's will for you. Don't render evil for evil to anybody. Follow after things that are good. Support the weak. Be patient with everybody. Comfort the feeble-minded and people who are anxious and nervous and afraid. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. And in everything that you do, give thanks. How do you know if something is right or wrong? Well, if you were about to open up a six-pack of beer later on this afternoon, could you open up that six-pack of beer and say, Lord God, please bless this six-pack. I thank you for providing this alcohol that is going to dull my senses um, and draw me farther away from you. Uh, Please bless it in Jesus' name, amen. I mean, How could you pray over a six-pack of beer? I don't think you could. But the Bible says, In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So it's an amazing thing that when you do these things that are laid out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you warn them that are unruly, you you comfort the feeble-minded, you support the weak, be patient with all men, you stop rendering evil for evil. How many times have you seen Christians stab each other in the back? And they always have a good reason why they do it. But over the 30 years that I've been saved, I have seen that born-again saved Christians aren't really any better at not rendering evil for evil to any man than unsaved people. I have seen some unbelievable examples of betrayal, not just in my life, but in the lives of people around me. Over the last 30 years, I have seen some stunning examples of Christians absolutely obliterating other Christians for whatever reason that they chose to do it. The Bible says if if somebody faults you, the Bible tells you to take it and to pray for that person. That's what the Bible says. The Bible the Bible says uh, uh, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. And yet how many Christians do we see 
that go around stabbing other Christians in the back and hatching all these schemes and plans and and that type of conduct is apps I mean that's what lost people do but even among lost people I see less of that than I see it in the body of Christ because saved people have a tendency to get puffed up and to start to think that they are better than other people. That's why you stab people in the back. That's why you hatch all these plans and schemes and uh, to build your little kingdoms. Social media like Twitter and Facebook, uh, you can see these things happening every single day where people want to build a little kingdom and they want to build this and they want to build that and they're going to tear down everybody that stands in their way. And that is absolutely shameful behavior. I have tried very, very hard over the 11 years that I've been on social media, 12 years. I have tried very, very hard to not engage in that type of behavior. I'm not trying to build a kingdom. I have a ministry that God gave me, and I'm trying my best to do that ministry. And I'm trying my best to not tear down other people while I do it. 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, uh, verse 12 And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus." This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The Apostle Paul was the greatest Christian that ever lived. God used Paul to write 14 of the 27 books of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul says that he is going to walk us down the aisle, so to speak. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Talking about the body of Christ at the judgment seat. The Apostle Paul is a man that is highly honored by God. And yet, what does Paul say about himself? He says that he is the chief of sinners. That's what Paul says about himself. Paul says that he deserves a place at the back of the line. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, being defamed we entreat, we are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things Unto this day, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. And the Apostle Paul put himself at the back of the line and said that he was the chief of sinners. Yet how many of us want to put ourselves at the front of the line and we forget all about the miry pit that we were saved from? Now, getting back to a Revelation chapter 11, verse 4. Revelation chapter 11, verse 4. Nope, other way around. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Had a little dyslexia there. Revelation 4, 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. I told you at the start of the broadcast today that I spent an hour last night watching um, Dr. Ruckman's personal testimony, how he be, he came to be saved. And uh, it's very powerful testimony. And he, he gets very emotional at parts when he's talking about uh, he was suicidal and his life was collapsing and he's running through the streets of downtown Pensacola at night trying to find a Bible. 
And he recounts that after he got saved, he realized that almost nobody on the downtown streets of Pensacola was preaching the gospel to lost people. We prayed earlier for Jeffrey in Kentucky, who's going to be preaching at the Red Sox, not Red Sox, Cincinnati Reds. He's going to be preaching at the Cincinnati Reds game at one o'clock today, central time. And what a blessing that is. Now, every single one of those people that listen to him, they may refuse to take a gospel track and there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, We pray that they will take the tracks and you should definitely have them in your hand in case they do. But maybe they won't. But what they can't stop themselves from doing is they can't stop themselves from listening to the preaching of the gospel. Now, I'm sure it's, it's summertime, and I'm sure that Ohio, which is a beautiful place to be, I don't know what the weather is like in Cincinnati today, but maybe I'm, it's a beautiful day here in Florida. The sun is shining and the sky is blue and the birds are chirping. I'm sure there's better things that Jeffrey could be doing than taking an hour and a half from his day and going out to a baseball game that he's not watching, but preaching to all the people as they go in and out through the entrances. I'm sure there's more enjoyable ways that he could be spending his Sunday afternoon than preaching to people who don't really have a very high interest in what his message is. So why is he doing it? Why do we go out into the streets and preach? Why do we hand out gospel tracts to people who give us those funny looks? Why are we willing to have family members no longer having communication with us, as is true in my own family? Why don't we just compromise? And why don't we just go along to get along And we can just live our lives and we can let the silent gospel be a witness for us, as they say in the evangelical churches. Why don't we do that? Why do we give up Saturdays and Sundays to preach and teach and to warn lost people about hell? Why at family functions do we open our mouths and witness for Jesus Christ knowing that It's going to be rejected, and at some point, we are going to be rejected. Why do we do that? Why don't we just compromise and get along? Well, the reason why we do that is because Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. That's why we do it. We do it because hell is real and God has provided a way out. Now, when you think about that, when you think about um, it doesn't matter what you have or don't have in this life. My grandmother lived to be a hundred years old. Now, I've known people that died when they were teenagers. I know babies that have died. But by and large, Most people still live to be about 70, 72, 75, right around there. My mom died when she was 68 years old. My dad died when he was 77. What would be the average? Right around 71 or 72. The Bible says that we get three score and 10. And, you know, by reason of strength, we get uh, four score. But by and large, the vast number of people are going to die between the ages of 68 and 80. And that's the life that we get. And then comes eternity. Not 70 years, not 100 years, not 200 years, not 1,000 years. But after we die comes eternity. When you preach and you teach and you witness and you hand out gospel tracts in whatever way that God has called you to do it, there's no right way. 
when you pray and say, God, give me something to do for you, uh, Lotan has a ministry on YouTube. And um, you, you may not be familiar with his story, but Lotan is a man, he's a graphic artist, a very, very talented graphic artist who came up in Hollywood, a lot like how I came up in Hollywood. And at some point, Lotan got saved, and he decided that he wanted to use his, his talent that God had given him with graphic art, and he has a YouTube ministry. And he makes these amazing videos that illustrate Bible teaching. And what he did is he took the, the, um, the, the talent that God had given him and he used it for Jesus Christ. If you want to see his website, you can go to kjvpictures.com. Go to kjvpictures.com and you will see Lotan's uh, ministry. And it's an amazing, it's beautifully done. He's a very talented artist. Um, and and uh, he has a website. He has a YouTube channel. He did what God put in his wheelhouse to do. Now, you may not be a talented graphic artist. But whatever it is that God gave you the ability to do, you should do it. And the reason why that you should do it is because God is worthy. He's worthy for you to put the time in because God put the time in for you. God didn't have to go to the cross, but he did. And the reason why he did it is because of his great love that he has For us. So much love that he came down from heaven. He took upon himself the form of a man. And he humbled himself. To the obedience of the cross. Hebrews chapter 12 says this. Wherefore seeing we are also compassed about. With so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12.2 says, that when Jesus thought about the cross, when he thought about the job that he had to do, he counted it all joy because this was the job that God had given him to do. And he was joyous about doing it. In John chapter 4, John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And then he tells you what that work is. Say ye not, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look unto the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered in to their labors." Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And then he talks about in the context, he talks about witnessing, sharing the gospel, warning lost people that hell is real. That's the harvest in John chapter four. The apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20 Starting in verse 22, 
Acts 20, verse 22, Paul says this, And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. Why? So that I might finish my course. This is Second Timothy 4, 6 through 8. So that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul was told by numerous people that the Holy Ghost was speaking to him through. Paul was told that if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be put in chains. You can read about that in Acts chapter 26. Paul Paul was told that if he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to be put in chains, he's going to be put in prison, and he's never ever going to get out and that he's going to be executed. When you read 2 Timothy chapter 4, 6 through 8, Paul has a very, very high understanding of what is about to happen to him. But he says, none of these things move me. I am not afraid. I am not counting my life dear unto myself. Why? <laughs> Revelation four eleven. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Is God worthy in your life? Is God worthy enough for you to serve Him and to give up some of your pleasure for His power and His purpose, for His kingdom? Revelation 4.11 says that when they were up in the throne room of God, And they were in eternity. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Do you know why you don't serve God? Because you don't think he's worthy. Do you know why you don't give up your Saturday or Sunday afternoon to go hand out gospel tracts? Because you don't think God is worthy. Do you know why you don't witness to family members? because you you would rather just keep the peace. The reason why you don't witness to family members is because you don't think God is worthy. And you just want to maintain peace at all costs. Peace, peace. But there is no peace, the Bible says. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. That's First Thessalonians 5, 3. But then verse 4 says, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Why are you not in darkness? Because you're saved, and you're born again. And now that you are saved, And you are born again. What does Jesus say to the Laodicean church? That lukewarm church that we find ourselves in right here and right now. Jesus says in Revelation 3, 15 and 16, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Do you know why the Laodicean church is lukewarm? Because they don't believe that God is worthy. Because if they believe that God is worthy, they would give up something for God's kingdom. I'm not talking about giving up chocolate for Lent or giving up alcohol for Lent or smoking cigarettes for Lent. I'm not talking about that type of giving something up, which is really ridiculous if you think about it. What I'm talking about is giving up the things to God that have the most meaning and value to you. The only way that you could do that is if you believed, Revelation 4.11, that God is worthy to receive honor and power and riches and glory. 
God, do you think God needs money? Do you think God needs bags of gold up in heaven? That's not the riches that the Bible's talking about. When you give to God, and again, I am not talking about money. When you give to God the things that are important to you, you do that because you believe that God is worthy to receive that from you. And that's how you get on fire for Jesus Christ. You begin to say to yourself, God is worthy. And because he's worthy, he is worthy of my time and my talent and my sacrifice. However small that it might be. Remember that little boy with five loaves and two fishes. I don't think that he, when he left his house that morning with five little loaves of pita bread and two little smoked fishes, I don't think that that little boy felt like he was starting a catering company. But that's how the day wound up. Because Jesus Christ took those five tiny loaves and those two small fishes and he made it something that could feed 5,000 people with 12 baskets of fragments left over. How could he do that? Well, because Jesus Christ is worthy. Why did the boy give up his lunch? The little boy gave up his lunch because he felt that Jesus Christ was worthy to receive it. And how much of his lunch did he give? He gave it all. He gave the five loaves and the two fishes. He didn't know that a miracle was going to happen. He didn't even think he, that he would have lunch for himself. That little boy was asked to give up the lunch that he had because he thought Jesus Christ was worthy. Is Jesus Christ worthy of you handing out gospel tracts on a Saturday afternoon when all your friends are at the beach? Is Jesus Christ worthy of you on a Sunday afternoon to go preach in front of a baseball game instead of buying a ticket and having a beer and a dog and, and wasting three hours of your life watching a meaningless pursuit? I'm not preaching against sports. I'm just simply saying, when you get to the place in your life where you believe Revelation 4.11 when you believe that God truly is worthy, then there's nothing too great that you won't give up for him. And I want you to think about that today. I want you to think about where you are in your life and where you want to be in your life. Now, if you're not saved, I want you to get saved. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you're listening to this message today and you're lost, go back and listen to it again. Because I gave dozens and dozens of Bible verses that any one of those you can get saved on. But if you are saved and if you are born again, and you have things in your life that you want God to do, How worthy do you think God is for you to give up what's dear to you? Like that little boy with his lunch. Or how about the widow with her two mites? And all the Pharisees were putting in bags of money into the temple treasury. And Jesus said, I'm not impressed by those bags of money. Because those people have many, many, many more bags of money. It's nothing, absolutely nothing for a multimillionaire to give $5,000 to charity or $100,000 to charity. That's nothing. But for a widow to give the last two cents that she has or the widow of Nain from the Old Testament who's going to die with her son and Elijah says, well, before you die, feed me first. And she has to give the prophet her lunch. 
That's what Revelation 4.11 is talking about. It's talking about when you believe that God is worthy, then you'll know what to do. Then, if you don't have a calling, you'll get a calling. And maybe one of the reasons why you don't think that God has given you a job to do, because maybe you don't think that God is worthy. Maybe you need to change your perspective. Maybe you need to change your attitude. Because when you see that God is worthy for what he has, if God never answers another prayer in your entire life, God is, has already done so much for you, it's incalculable. Is God worthy? When you come to the place where you can answer that question, God has a storeroom of spiritual blessings for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, Father God, for everything that you uh, have done for us and everything that you will do for us. We thank you, God, um, uh, for giving us a calling, for giving us a job to do. And Lord, let us reach down deep and acknowledge that you're worthy today, Lord, and there's nothing that is too much for us to give up for you and to give to your cause and to your kingdom. And we thank you. We praise you, Father, Lord, for this time and for all these prayers and for all these people that you've gathered together. And uh, as we go about our day today, Lord, let us go with a mindset that you are worthy to receive honor and praise and glory and riches. And we thank you and praise you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, There's a lot of new books in the bookstore. Please go to BibleBeliever.com and check out all the things that are new. Uh, We added a lot of new titles over the weekend, a lot of good witnessing tools. So uh, go to BibleBeliever.com and check it out. Have a great afternoon, and Lord willing, we'll see you back here, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, for another edition of our Rightly Dividing King James Bible Study. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Oh uh-huh.